Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 233, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with none other than Miss Brenda Romero. Now Brenda, uh, formerly known as uh, Brenda Brathwaite, <laughs> before she married John Romero, is a fantastic developer with roots that go all the way back to the very dawn of the industry. She's worked on the Wizardry series, the Jagged Alliance series, and a game called Playboy uh, the Mansion that I'm pretty sure you'll want to hear more about, and much, 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 much more. Anyway, we've got a lot of great stuff to cover. So, without further ado, here is Miss Brenda Romero. All right, folks, I am here with the great Brenda Romero, uh, formerly Brenda Braithwaite. She's one of the 100 most influential women in the games industry, and also the woman with the longest continuous service in the games industry. She's currently the program director at UC Santa Cruz Master's Program in Games and Playable Media. How are you today, Brenda? I'm all right. I'm all right. How are you? Doing great. I wanted to get started by talking about uh, how you got interested in games. I, I was reading some interviews you did earlier where you talked about your love of Lego blocks. Now you think that actually translated into this later uh, love of level design. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Um, yeah, so my, my niece and nephew had these Legos. I didn't actually somehow manage to get Legos when I was a little kid. But they had these Legos. And they had enough so that I could actually build a space with them. I could build something. And I, I remember, I have this super vivid memory of, of tearing all the Legos down and building this world up and being really excited about what I had built. And I'm sure if you looked at it from the outside, it looked like, well, I mean, it looked like a bunch of Legos, like something a kid would build. But for me, this was a whole world of adventure and there were things in those rooms and there were hallways. And, and um, I remember it as, I would say, my first designed play space. Uh, so I, I very excitedly called my relatives in to look at it and they, they looked at it like, like any parent would look at a kid's Lego thing, like, oh, that's great, honey. And then they walked away and I thought they totally missed the point. Um, but it, for me, that was the beginning of it. And I, I played with Legos as, as, you know, I think that's, that's common to most game designers. I'm sure we could check off that box, <laughs> played with Legos obsessively. Um, and you know, I, I now have, uh, I now have four kids here in the house, two of whom are very much into Legos. So, so I guess I, I still have a pretty sizable Lego collection, including a bunch of World of Warcraft Legos. So I was wondering, too, what video games you played. Were you hanging out at arcades? Or were you more of a computer game uh, uh, fan? It, well, it, before, even before video games show up, I, I used to put, my mother, my mother would let me buy um, board games at yard sales. But since we didn't have a ton of money, I, I didn't get the new board games. So I would get these um, broken board games with the pieces and parts that uh, they weren't all there. And so then I would have to invent my own rules to make this game playable because it was missing a lot of the pieces that were necessary. Um, so that, that I think is what started my incredible love of, um, of game design and, and my continuing love of non-digital games. And then I had, um, I, the first video game that I remember, um, you know, so when the arcades, when the arcades hit Ogdensburg and I, I grew up in this tiny little town in northern New York. And um, although we had, I believe, three arcades there, if we include the bowling alley, um, I remember playing Pac-Man. I remember dumping my allowance every week in the Tron. It was just in the machine and gone instantly, every single week. I, I Miss Pac-Man was okay, but it was Tron that I obsessed about. Um, it was, which, which Tron was it? Uh, the original one, I think. The, the discs of, was it discs of Tron or something like that? I don't even remember. I don't even remember, but I remember exactly how to get through the spider level still by my movement. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I had that normal upbringing. Um, I was very fortunate, well, normal upbringing for a game designer. And then I got pretty heavily into, um, into arcade culture and, and arcade games. I trying to think about, you know, in our house, we, my mom somehow managed to get a Commodore 64 and I had a tape drive and I used to love to code in stuff that you, you remember like they they would have the code that came in magazines and you would type all that in and changing the variables to see what would happen and you know most of the times it was just a color change or you'd have more of something or less of something on the screen um, but my first uh, my first deep love affair with games actually happened when I got the D&D white box set when I was 11 years old uh, and man, that made that my Lego world was suddenly super real. And oddly enough, you know, I never put the two of them together. I never thought, well, 
I don't know how that even would look, right? But um, but I never put the two of them together. But man, that was the pathway to adventure. Uh, so I played D and D a lot, and then and then I went from D and D to uh, Iron Crown's Role Master system, and that was my first um, that was my first game design. And I, I didn't like the encumbrance rules. They felt a lot like balancing your checkbook. Not that I would have had the foggiest, foggiest idea what that meant at 14, but it just felt like anytime you wanted to move, it felt like we needed to call it a math teacher. So I rewrote the encumbrance rules. And then because the encumbrance rules affected other things, I rewrote those. And then I just kept rewriting until I had rewritten the entire, um, <laughs> the entire book. And I don't have it anymore. I mean, I wish I did because I'm sure it's some, it's some pretty funny stuff. Um, but then eventually at 15, I, I, uh, I get a job at Surtech Software. And that's where, you know, my 20 year love affair with Wizardry began. Let's uh, back up just a minute here. I heard you say your mother had a Commodore 64. So was she the, was she into computer games too, into computers? No, my mom, no. There was, you know, oddly enough, uh, nobody around me, nobody, not my brother's a musician, a professional musician. Um, and my sister's a nurse, and my mother read books obsessively. So nobody, nobody, not, no, none of my friends, I don't know how it happened. It's, just, it's a fluke. Nobody around me was into computers, but I was. I mean, computers were, were massive problems to figure out. They were super exciting. I, I, you know, it was the same thing as Legos, except to digital. You could make magic happen there. All right, so let's get into the, the third tech era because this is really fascinating to me so you're only 15 years old yeah isn't that great so and you had a, you had a friend named linda as i understand yeah. and, uh, she knew the company i mean how did this work exactly oh this is you know i i have you have a lot of people and particularly since i teach now you know i have a lot of people ask me like how, do, how did you get into the game industry and i'm pretty sure my story would not work today and it's this is profoundly bad advice but here's how i got into the game industry <laughs> Um, so Linda Curry, uh, then Linda Saratech, she actually didn't work for the company. She was one of the owners. So Linda was either 15 or 16 at the time. And we both went to the same high school and Linda was trying to get rid of her job at Saratech, which was this. If somebody called and said, how do I get to the 10th wizard on the 10th level? How do I kill word man? How do I even find word man? She would say, you have to teleport to, you have to go to the fourth level where you need to get the blue ribbon and then you take the blue ribbon to get into the private elevator. The private elevator will take you to the ninth level. And on the ninth level, there's a door to your left and you go through that door and in the corner of that room, there is a teleporter to the 10th floor that'll take you down to Wordna. And there's a series of seven hallways. Like whole sections of my brain are still, <laughs> are still devoted to remembering this. Although nobody calls me asking me these questions anymore. So Linda wanted to get rid of that job. It was, you know, it's the wizardry hotline was the name of it. Uh, she wanted to get rid of that job. And so um, I was standing, this is where the story gets really lame. I was standing in the bathroom, which isn't really a networking spot, I guess, unless you're at GDC. Uh, standing in the bathroom, smoking a cigarette, because that's what, bear in mind, I grew up in northern New York where eight feet of snow falls, right? So so if you, were, uh, and if you were a bad kid and you wanted to smoke in school, that's where you went to do it. So I'm standing in the, in the bathroom smoking a cigarette when Linda comes in and Linda asks, I can see she's asking people uh, for a cigarette, but evidently they're all offering her menthols. So eventually I say, you know, are you looking for a non-menthol? And then I give her a cigarette. And to be polite, I'm assuming she just, or, or out of desperation to get rid of her job, she she has, a, she, she's, you know, strikes up a conversation and she says to me, um, do you have a job? To which I can go and, um, are you interested in one? Well, sure. Have you ever heard of Surtech? No. Have you ever heard of Wizardry? No. Have you ever heard of D&D? Yes. In fact, I was a D&D player. And so from that single conversation, I showed up at her house, um, uh, the next, the following Tuesday. And that's where I first saw Wizardry. Um, and I worked from, uh, my job was from four to eight. That's when the hotline was open. So my job was from four to eight and I would eventually be there from, you know, three to nine and then, and then two to 10. And, you know, man, if I, if I could have time with that Apple too, I mean, there's, there was no way, and there's no way my family ever could have afforded an Apple too, but man, if I could have time with that Apple too, I was there. It was the coolest thing ever. I still have Somewhere, um, I still have my original uh, wizardry disc with my characters on it. 
which I can't get rid of because it, it would feel like murder. You know, I was with those guys for so long, but that's, that's my really lame how I got started story. I mean, I, I certainly took advantage of it, but that's, that's how I got started. I love that. It's a non-mentholated cigarette of destiny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions related to that. Uh, one, I was wondering what's the weirdest sort of calls you got about uh, wizardry? And then did you get to work with uh, her C. Andrew Greenberg and Robert Woodhead? Oh, yeah. I mean, so Greenberg, not so much. Um, Woodhead, at the time, Surtech occupied a few buildings. Well, Surtech started... Um, at a little, in a little tiny place, uh, at Six Main Street, um, and it was a a spoon company, believe it or not. Remember commemorative spoons? Oh well, yeah, yeah, I used to get those from on vacations and such. Yeah, so they they actually shared office space with this place called Commemorative Spoons, and that's what they made. And then it was very obvious that things were going a little too well, and there wasn't enough room there, um, and games weren't shipped digitally then. So I like the point. They were shipped digitally, but in a box on a disc. So Surtech, um, Surtech quickly moved out of there and they moved into some offices in uh, the somewhat defunct Ogdensburg Mall. So Greenberg, or not Greenberg, but Woodhead was there, uh, certainly. And, you know, our, when, I, when I first started there, um, I'm not sure. No, I think he came later, but um, Woodhead was there and uh, Arthur Bruto was there working on Rescue Raiders. Um, yeah, so they were there. I saw them all the time. So what's the strangest calls you would get about wizardry? That's a, that's a, some of those games are so difficult. I mean, these hotlines must have been flooded at times. Uh, yeah. So the strange, what are the strangest calls I ever got about wizardry? Um, man, you know, I think that some of the things that I remember, we knew that uh, Robin Williams was a uh, wizardry fan. And so I always wondered. Wow, if, you got a call from him, huh? No, I don't know if I did. <laughs> this is what I'm feeling. So every phone <laughs> call that sounded even slightly Robin Williams-ish, I always wonder, geez, am I talking to him? Um, and the things that I remember, though, you know, people would, uh, you know, this seems absurd nowadays, but people would teleport their characters into rock. So if you had bad teleport coordinates and where you were teleporting to was rock, your characters were teleported into rock and they were toast. They were done. Um, or if you tried to resurrect your character once, and if it failed, it turned the character to ashes. And then if that failed, it, they were just erased. They were just deleted from the disc. It was the original perma fail and um, permadeath. Uh, well, no, I guess since you had two tries, it wasn't, it wasn't totally. It was permadeath with, with a saving throw. Um, but I remember people calling just, just desperate. I mean, like the just the desperation in their voices like please can you please find my characters can you please help me save my characters in getting discs we would get discs in the mail that had been through some kind of travesty um you know like fire and they looked a little melted and can you please try to get the characters off or or water damage or like a dog had chewed it and we used to save somewhere i, don't, I can't remember i don't remember us having this on the wall but we, we did have this file of, of, um, of crazy discs, like, can you please save my characters? I'm like, a big chunk of the disc is missing. Uh, I do remember getting letters from people who were really concerned that because Wizardry had, uh, you just same stuff as D&D, &D, right? That Wizardry had, had greater demons in it and lesser demons that we were quite possibly all going to hell, um, and, and that, that we needed to have our soul saved. We used to get lots of those letters. Uh, you know, to me, those are the ones that really stand out. I mean, most of them were just people stuck. Um, but, but I really remember the very emotional pleas, like, <laughs> please save my character. You know, and when you would save the character, you would get letters back, you know, like just overflowing with gratitude that you had, that you had somehow resurrected this character, you know, from a, from uh, digital bits. Yeah, whoever that was that said video games never made them cry has never played wizardry, right? <laughs> yeah. So I was reading uh, some some of your other interviews, and one thing I thought was interesting, uh, even though you were there at the you know ground floor of the launch of the industry, you apparently had didn't really think that this was really going to become this big cultural phenomenon, right? You didn't realize you were in the midst of this historical uh, period. 
you know, I, I didn't. Isn't that interesting? And I, the reason I didn't, so I've talked a lot with John about this. So he had the benefit of, uh, John Romero, my husband, he had the benefit of growing up here on the West Coast. So all around him, you know, like, like he knew names, you know, he knew programmed by Nasser and, and he had an idea where Nasser was and he knew who Bill Budge was um, and he could go down. He met, the, he went to Beagle Brothers as a kid, right? So he at least had an idea. He had stores that he could go to and all that I knew, 100% of my game industry was wizardry, the games that Sir Tech was making and that was it. Right, there were, it was a, the town was, um, I mean, it's a small town, still is a small town, um, you know, maybe 20,000 people, and there were no software stores, no game stores, for sure, so I didn't know of any other kids who were into games, we had board games, you know, that you could buy at, I think the store was Ames, um, but there just, there wasn't, there wasn't any evidence of any game culture anywhere around me, so so it just didn't make any sense for people to, um, there's just not necessarily a way you would have known, right? Computers were, you know, a lot of people still wondered at that point in time where computers, you know, how computers would be used. And it was still largely viewed as this business thing. And I remember, and it's just an interesting thing. And you know, I talked about programming games early, like messing around on the Commodore. And at the high school at OFA, um, they taught a course in basic programming. And I, I fell in love with it. I, I remember being told like, for our final in accounting that as long as we programmed it, we could use whatever we wanted if we programmed it ourselves. So I basically, it was easy. Like, I programmed every form of depreciation. You know, I QA'd it, it worked, it was solid. I brought the disc in and got 100 on the test and that was the last time it was ever allowed um, that I'm aware of. Uh, but I started, you know, at Surtech, I, I got very into... Um, very into pro, not Sertech, at, at in school I got very into programming and then I actually convinced the school to please set up this programming lab and please start teaching Pascal, which which I've since learned is it was kind of bizarre, but Wizardry was programmed in Pascal, so I thought that was the next language that I needed to learn. Um, and then I ended up just falling head over heels in love with, with Wizardry and just working all the time and not taking that class anyway. Um, but but you know, back to the original question, no, I didn't really have a sense of it and the people that were directing um, directing me at that point in time, you know, guidance counselors and whatnot, they didn't really have an idea that there was this massive industry exploding either. So when it came time for me to go to college, um, you know, I went for something which in hindsight was a really great major for a game designer, uh, tech communications, technical communications, which is um, you, you finish the software and then I'm going to write the documentation for the software for the users. Except for game designer, I'm thinking of what would the users want, right? How about if I write the documentation for you to make this? So I just ended up going in the other direction. Um, but yeah, I, did, you know, I just didn't really have any idea that all that was happening because there were, there were no stores, there were no nothing. So unless it came to me through Surtech, uh, I didn't have it. But I did, you know, I was at that point in time, I'm still very active in, in board games and in role playing games, traditional pencil and paper games. So that was the industry that I saw. Although, at some point in time, I don't remember when Magic the Gathering came out, but holy lord, oh my god, oh my god, that, you know, that's probably the, that game, I just, I can't even tell you how hardcore I got into Magic the Gathering, it was paycheck, direct to store, cards, home. How Every many cards do you have? Um, I guess I should, how many truckloads of cars do you, cars ah! do you have? <laughs> Well, I mean, I've pared a lot of them down now. Um, I, I, I pared most of them down. I mean, I have, I started playing really early on, so I still have some beta cards. Um, but uh, I don't know, probably thousands. I mean, yeah, thousands, probably not tens of thousands, but thousands is fair. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the second installment of this interview with Miss Brenda Romero. And I have to say, this is an interview that just keeps getting better and better with each installment. So if you like this one, you definitely want to stay tuned for the next one. I, I promise you that. A lot of uh, great stuff coming up. Uh, believe you me. 
And as always, I want to thank you very, very much if you have supported my show. Uh, you can support me at Patreon. I uh, just look for the link in the show notes. That'll also give you access to some special uh, Patreon-only podcasts and, and such. So please uh, consider uh, that. Um, if you want to support me via, uh, via PayPal, though, still very happy and very thankful for your support. Um, and as always, if you want to tell some friends about the show, it really, really helps. Any of those ways, guys, and whatever you do to support the show, I really appreciate it. I want you to know that. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a burning river. This is a handcrafted pale ale from Cleveland, Ohio, from the Great Lakes Brewing Company. I've had some of the uh, Great Lakes brews before. They've always been uh, really, really nice. Uh, it's apparently the world champion gold medal winner. Uh, let's see. Named after the 1969 burning of the Cuyahoga River. Okay, not sure how a, <laughs> a river catches fire, but I'll take their word for that. Uh, 6% alcohol, so not a very strong uh, beer. I mean, a little stronger than a Budweiser, I guess, but uh, hopefully not anything that would knock you out. Um, let's see what else is here. Uh, not seeing anything else. Uh, so uh, let's get this. Uh, oh, wait, they tell you about the, how the river caught fire. <laughs> what do you do when your river catches fire from excessive pollution? Clean it up and throw a hopping party. Okay, so <laughs> I hope they didn't make this beer with some of that polluted river water. Scary thought. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so we've got this burning river here in this rather excellent drinking horn. I've been trying to uh, ascertain as much as I can from the smell of this. We get sort of a, a citrusy, hoppy flavors to it. Uh, pretty much what you would expect uh, from a pale ale. <sighs> Handcrafted pale ale. <laughs> a lot of a sort of like a lemon rind uh, scent to it. But all in all, pretty, you know, pretty good, uh, pretty good aroma here. So let's give it a taste. <sighs> That's good. Uh, it's not overpowering. You definitely taste the, the hops in there. It's kind of a, ch a lot of chocolatey, coffee-like flavors to it. Uh, a little bit lighter than, uh, say, a stout, but you definitely taste the, just that little bit of bitterness there, a little bit of a nutty-like flavor to it. Um, all in all, quite good. I mean, I'm not going to say it's the best ale I've ever had, <laughs> uh, but it's definitely not bad. I think on, a, on my usual scale, I'm going to go for the uh, three out of five drinking horns on this uh, Burning River. Uh, definitely not bad. You know, there's, there's better ales out there, but if you see this, if, you know, if there's an option between this and Budweiser, uh, no question, go for the Burning River. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, the quotation I found was from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. It goes something like this. Magic is believing in yourself. If you can do that, you can do anything. See you guys next week. Behind our masks, we're perfectly ordinary people.